All right. Now, um, we're continuing on with our series of, of going through the Ten Commandments. And tonight I'm going to be preaching on the fifth commandment of keeping the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And if you want to flip, keep your finger here in Exodus 16 where we started reading. Um, we're going to look at Exodus 20. It's got the Ten Commandments in it. And we'll just read the verses that refer to the Sabbath day. Starting in verse number 8, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Holy means separated or set apart. It's a special day that's sanctified. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this goes all the way back when he gives us an explanation of the Sabbath day. Basically, the Sabbath day is just, it's, it's set apart, it's sanctified, and it's a day of rest. It's a day where you're not supposed to be doing any work whatsoever. You're not supposed to be doing any work. You're not supposed to have any employees, servants, you know, anyone doing work for you. Even your animals aren't supposed to be doing any work. If you have cattle, you know, oxen, they're not supposed to be out plowing. They're not supposed to be treading out any wine or doing any, any type of work like that. It's a day of rest. Everyone's supposed to be resting from their works. And he explains here in Exodus 20 that um, it says that God created the heaven. When God made the creation, he did it all in six days. He worked for those first six days when he created everything. And then he rested on the seventh. And he says, because of this, because God rested on that seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He blessed that day. He, he, he set it apart. He sanctified it and said, this is a special day. I worked for six days and I rested on the seventh. And I want you to observe the same things. Now, um, right here, we get some proof. You know, there's a lot of people who... They'll believe in creation, but they don't believe that God made it in six literal days, you know, in six 24-hour days. This is a pretty good place to turn to. If someone's already saved, they understand the Bible, but, you know, that maybe they don't believe the six-day creation, show them Exodus chapter 20. Show them this verse because it says the whole reason that, that he ordained for people to observe the Sabbath and not do any work on the seventh day is because that's exactly what he did. Because he worked for six days and rested on the seventh. And it only makes sense that he did his creation in six days, like the Bible says. I mean, to say that this, it says six days, but it doesn't really mean six days, is kind of foolish. And you can't prove that from Scripture anywhere. To the contrary, everything that the Bible talks about in creation, the evening and the morning were the first day. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, the evening and the morning were the second day. Here it says, in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. There is nothing to indicate that there is some long period of time on each of these days. They don't want to call them like a regular day. The only reason people do that at all is because they're deceived by science falsely so-called today that will tell you, oh, no, 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 there's no way that it happened like that. There was this evolution, there's this big bang, and all these things happened. It took millions and billions of years for everything to be created. They, some Christians buy into that lie and they think that they need to make the Bible fit with this religion of a falsely so-called science that is just completely untrue to, to make God's Word fit with that. You don't need to make God's Word fit because what He said is the truth. What the Bible says is true, that, this, that everything that was created was made in those first six days. And God rested on the seventh. But we're going to be studying the Sabbath day today. And it's interesting because I just we just went out soul winning. Um, this afternoon, and I talked to a girl who said that is really bizarre. I've never run across anyone like this. She said it's a non-denominational church. I asked her about salvation. She said that like you need to believe, you need to repent, and you need to be baptized. And she says, well, we don't worship on Sunday. We we we're, we're Sabbath keepers. Is what she said. We're Sabbath keepers. She said, we're not Seventh-day Adventists. We're Sabbath keepers, though. And we do everything on Saturday. And it's a non-denominational church. And she said, and I'm like, you have to be baptized to be saved? She said, yes. I said, well, what about the thief on the cross? 
Like he didn't get baptized. He said, well, I don't know that much scripture. I, you know, I'm still learning and stuff. And I was, you know, trying to show her. But it's interesting. She just kept on, it was like, she didn't know hardly anything. She didn't want to hear anything. She said, I'm third generation. I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested. Over and over, I'm not interested. She doesn't know anything about the scripture, but all she knows is that she kept on making this big deal about the Sabbath day. And I quoted a few verses that I'm going to get to a little, in a little while regarding the Sabbath day in the New Testament and what the Bible says about us keeping the Sabbath day and should we be doing that. And I quoted a couple verses for her and she just didn't have anything to say. But what's interest, what I found interesting in that whole conversation is that she didn't know anything, but, but wherever she was going or whoever she's talking to makes a big deal about this Sabbath day. Like that is what's most important. Like, yeah, we don't, we're not like all these other people kind of lifting themselves up. We worship on the Sabbath day. So I started asking her, well, do you work on the Sabbath? No, I don't work. Well, do you cook? Do you do this? Do you do that? I says, if you're gonna, if you're gonna put the importance of the Sabbath day, and you think that we really need to follow this, and they're like, oh yeah, and we we follow, we keep the feast days and all the other stuff too. And she's like, we keep the Passover. I said, do you kill a lamb? Well, no, no. Why don't you kill that? Well, we don't have to do that. <laughs> okay, you know, it's this, and it's this Hebrew roots movement that's crept in, and apparently there's a church here that teaches this stuff. This garbage, this nonsense. But, um, you know, she's lifting herself up, essentially, and the one thing that she thinks she knows is that we need to keep the Sabbath day and we worship on the Sabbath, not on Sunday. And um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, why that's so foolish. But um, flip back over to Exodus chapter 6. I want to go over a few more points over the, um, on the Sabbath. And some of the... the Command the, the some of the details of the Sabbath and how how strictly they really were supposed to to keep this commandment. Um, before we get into the the New Testament rendering or the New Testament um, teaching on the Sabbath, so we started off reading. We read the whole chapter of Exodus 16. I'm not going to read reread most of this. I'll just go to the pertinent parts. But mo that whole chapter deals mostly with the manna. You remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they needed food to eat. God provided manna for them. And the part that I want to point out is that they see said, okay, here's this food that you need to eat. God's going to provide food for you every single day. Every morning when you wake up, when the dude's on the ground, he's like, you're going to need to go and collect your food for the day. And you only need whatever you need for that day. He's like, don't get any more. Don't get any less. Just get what you need for that day. And, we re and they were supposed to be relying on God on a daily basis. So if they took some, of the, some extra, like to hide up or to store up for themselves for the next day, what would happen is it would breed worms and it would just get bad and moldy and rotten and just, and just go bad and they couldn't eat it. And because some people actually did that. You know, Moses said, don't get any more than you need for the day. Don't stock it up. Don't store it up. Don't put it aside. But they still didn't listen to him. Some of the people, they did it. They bred worms. It stank. And they couldn't eat it. It was useless. But what is extremely, what is really cool about this and what's so miraculous is that he said the only day out of the seven days that they can actually take more was on the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath. Because he said on the sixth day, Go ahead and take for yourself enough for two days because it's not going to be there on the Sabbath. And the reason why it wasn't going to be on the Sabbath is, be, is so that they can keep it holy because they weren't even supposed to go out and gather that food because that would be work. They would be working and they would be breaking the Sabbath that way. So the same exact food that if you just kept it overnight, bread worms and stank and, and was unedible, the same exact food on the sixth day did not do that when they kept in store for the seventh day. It was perfectly fine and they were even. Look at verse number um, 23 or in verse number 22 it says, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm there. And so, this, I mean, it's 
completely miraculous. Obviously, the manna itself was miraculous. Once they got into the promised land, the manna was gone. It's gone today. It's not provided for them anymore. But it was miraculous in the sense that God just gave them this food in the wilderness and that it, it, it behaved differently based on when they, they stored it. If they tried to keep it the, any other day besides the day before the Sabbath day, it would be no good the next day except for on the Sabbath day. And notice too, I want to point this out. It says, he, he tells them in order to keep the Sabbath that they bake whatever they want to bake or seethe like, like in water. You know, if you boil it, if you bake it, however you want to prepare this food, they prepared it the day before and then they kept it in store. They weren't even supposed to be preparing meals and doing this cooking and stuff on the Sabbath because it was a day of total rest. A day of total rest. And when I, I was talking to this girl today, it's, it's interesting too because I prepared for this sermon, obviously, and then I talked to this girl today. And I said, well, because I said, do you cook on Saturday? Or I, I said, do you work on Saturday? She said, no. And I said, well, do you cook? She said, well, yeah. I said, well, if you're going to follow the Sabbath day, if you think that that's something, according to the Bible, that we should be doing today, then why aren't you just following it the way that the Bible says that you ought to be following it? Why, you know, you're not supposed to be cooking on the Sabbath day. I said, in the Old Testament, if they found a guy gathering sticks on the Sabbath day and they put him to death. And she said, well, I'm not perfect. Well, we're not perfect. Like, well, so... Because you're not perfect, you just, you're just going to say, well, what, I'm just going to worship on Saturday. That's your compromise for keeping the Sabbath. Well, I'm just going to worship and we're going to make a big deal out of it and we're going to judge everyone else that worships on Sunday even though I'm really not keeping the Sabbath according to the Bible. It's hypocrisy. And, and these people, like, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they just focus everything. What's God's name? What's God's name? What's God's name? Seventh-day Adventists or, or people, whoever's going to this church, we worship on Saturday. We worship on Saturday. We keep the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath. These people that have these, these one-point issues, they're always wrong. They, they focus in on the wrong thing, first of all, but, but they're not even right. This is not a teaching that, this is not a, an ordinance. This is not a commandment that we need to be in adherence to in the New Testament today of keeping the Sabbath. Um, turn, if you would, to... Leviticus chapter 23, because we're going to see also that when the Bible is talking about the Sabbath, you have to make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, the Ten Commandments Sabbath is referring to the seventh day of the week to keep it holy. But there are Sabbaths, plural, um, that they're not always a Saturday. They're holy days. They're, they're days that are set apart, that are sanctified, that are just like the regular seventh day where you're not supposed to be doing any work. You're not supposed to be um, you know, doing anything. You're supposed to be resting. There are other days besides that seventh day that are exactly the same um, day of rest. Leviticus 23, look at verse 24. We'll see one of them here. The Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Now, if you're familiar with months of the year and the days of the week and stuff, the, the, the seventh month, the first day of the month, is not always going to be a Saturday, right? I mean, the day, the day is going to change. It's not always going to land on the seventh day of the week every year. It's going to be some days it might be a Monday, a Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. But it's calling this a Sabbath. He's saying you're going to have a Sabbath. So the Sabbath isn't always just on a Saturday. That's the regular Sabbath. And I'm saying Saturday in our modern um, calendars because Saturday, Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. So I'm going to keep on referring to the Sabbath as Saturday just for our own um, common understanding. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse 25 says, Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. So we had the, um, you know, the first day of the month, and now the, the tenth day of the month as well. Here's another 
Sabbath on these on, in the seventh month, you know, in this specific time. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So he's saying, you know, you're celebrating the Sabbath day. You're celebrating this day of no work. And it starts from evening the night before unto evening of the next, of the next day. That is when they, they counted their days starting and ending was from even unto even. And he said and that, so it lasted a full 24 hours, their Sabbath. It wasn't just from sun up to sundown. It was from even unto even, no work. So that's why you'll see oftentimes in the Bible as well, there's a preparation day. When Jesus was killed, when he was crucified, it was the preparation day because it was the day before the Sabbath. So the preparation means we need to make sure we're all ready. We need to make sure all the work that would need to be done tomorrow or the next day or you know, whenever the Sabbath is, that it's, that's taken care of. So that when the day comes, we don't have to do any work. We're set. We're good to go. Um, turn if you want to Exodus chapter 31. We spent quite a bit of time in the Old Testament for a little while, and then we're going to flip over to the New Testament. But um, we saw what we just read in Leviticus 23 about, a, about souls being cut off from among the people. Now, um, I don't believe it always means this, but in this, in this scenario, when, when someone didn't keep the Sabbath and it says their soul was cut off, that meant the death penalty. And I approve that to you from Exodus chapter 31. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So he's saying, one of the thing, reasons for the Sabbath, he says, this is a sign. It's a sign between me and you and it's for your generation. So it's, it's this, in a way, it's a tradition. It's a good tradition. It's a godly tradition. It's one that he established, but he says, this is going to be a sign for, for generations to come because this is one of those things that you can keep where, well, why don't we work on a Saturday? Well, you never work on Saturday. You never work on the Sabbath day. You know, this is, it's one of those things that's ingrained into their culture because they're obeying God's commandments, hopefully, and that it would be, you know, it's like church on Sunday, right? Why do we go to church on Sunday? Well, we always go to church on Sunday. You know, like, there's always church service on Sunday. Now, it doesn't mean there's not a good reason for that. We have a very good reason for what we meet on the first day of the week, and that's pattern after the New Testament when the believers got together and they congregated and they, they broke bread, bread and they got together and taught on the first day of the week. But um, we see here, that's a little bit of a side issue, we're looking at the seventh day, and as you institute a, um, you know, a tradition like that or people just don't work, that is a sign. That's something that future generations can even ask the question, why, you know, why, do we, why don't we work on Saturday? Oh, well, it's because you know, the Lord has made this a sign. God has commanded that we need to keep this day holy. That's why. And um, it brings up the Lord. But let's look at verse number 14 of Exodus 31. It says, Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So you see there he says, if you de defile the Sabbath day, you're put to death. And then it says that soul is going to be cut off. Meaning, you're getting put to death. Look at verse number 15. It says, six days may work be done. But in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So we see again, you know, there's a reference to creation, saying that God created the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. 
and this is a covenant that he made. He said, look, I want you to rest. I don't want you to, to continue working. And if you do it, this is how serious that punishment is. He says, if you do it, if you defile the Sabbath day, you're going to be put to death. Now, that alone ought to make us pause and say, this is, this is really serious. Because not every commandment has the death penalty as a result. But this breaking the Sabbath does. God is, is really intent on making sure that you don't break that Sabbath day. And, you know, one of the reasons could be it's, you know, if people don't quite understand it or whatever, um, you can start doing little things and then that would escalate and um, pretty soon the Sabbath will be ignored. But if the death penalty is on it, you're going to be very diligent to make sure that you're not doing any work um, to save your life. Now, look at Numbers chapter 15 because we see an example, and this is the example I was referring to of a man that's gathering sticks, and they have to execute this, they have to execute this judgment of putting this man to death. In Numbers 15 verse 32, the Bible says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And a lot of people like to make fun of this. Oh, you know, God killed people just for picking up sticks. And it wasn't just for picking up sticks, it's because he profaned the Sabbath day. Because it's a day that God made holy, God made his commandment. He said, look, you're not going to do any work. You can do work six days out of the week. He says, work Monday through Sunday through Friday, right? Do all your work. Get it all done. But this one day, you're not going to work. You should do no work in that day. And, you know, really it's for our benefit to, to not just work ourselves to death. God gives us a day of rest and it's a day to celebrate the, the rest that he's given unto us. And it's also symbolic, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But, so they find this man, he's gathering sticks, right? Verse number 33, And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. So basically, nothing was allowed to be done on the Sabbath but rest. I mean, not even starting a fire. And I, Exodus 35 Verse 2 says, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Even starting a fire was too much work to be done on the Sabbath day. Nothing. So, when we look at these scriptures, when we look at these verses that talk about the Sabbath day, it makes me sick that these people are so such hypocrites. They'll say out of one side, well, we need to keep the Sabbath. We need to keep the Sabbath. But then it's just whatever I say that means. Whatever that means to, to keep the Sabbath. Well, that just means we go to church on Saturday. That's hypocrisy. And that's not, I mean, if you want to tell, if you're going to say, I honestly believe that we need to keep the Sabbath and I don't believe it's been done away with, fine. If you're going to have an, an honest attitude, an honest heart towards the Bible, and that's really what you want to do, but then you better make sure that you're keeping yourself in adherence unto this commandment because there are so many things that you are not allowed to do on the Sabbath day according just to Scripture. I'm not even talking about the Jewish tradition or any of that. I'm not going to go to the Jews to tell me what's allowed and what's not allowed on the Sabbath day, we can get that from Scripture. It says here, I mean, the guy was picking up sticks. You can't even start a fire. You can't kindle yourself a fire on the Sabbath day. I wouldn't even, don't turn your stove on on the Sabbath day. You can't do that work. Um, Nehemiah chapter 10, if you want, you can turn it if you want. We're going to go look at Nehemiah 10 and Nehemiah 13. We're going to see here that they weren't even allowed to buy or sell from other people that weren't observing the Sabbath day. So like, you can't even go out to the store and buy anything. <clears throat> if you wanted to uh, uh, adhere to the Sabbath according to Scripture, if you think that that's something that we need to be doing today, then you better not be going out, probably not even driving your car, but going out to the store, going out to these places and, and purchasing anything because they're working and they're selling on the Sabbath day. You can't be preparing food for yourself. It should have been prepared the day before. You can eat it. You can't start a fire. You can't do anything. You just literally have to rest. 
Now, how many people today do you think are doing that? The only people that come to mind, I think, are maybe the Amish. Because I think they, they believe in this stuff and they're the only ones that, are, that might potentially not be hypocritical when it comes to trying to obey this commandment. Now, like that girl said, look, I know none of us is perfect, but there's a difference between not being perfect and intentionally just disobeying God's commandments and just saying, well, it's really not that big of a deal because whatever, you know, like we just make sure we go to church on Saturday. That's just total foolishness and hypocrisy. If you have a heart to want to try to serve God, I know we're not perfect, but try to do it the way the Bible says. Don't just make up something and say, well, we're going to make a mountain out of this molehill and, and make fun of everyone else for not doing things right because you worship on Sunday and we worship on Saturday. We're going to see how foolish that is. But look at Nehemiah chapter 10. We're going to see where they would not even allow um, anything to be bought or sold on that day. Nehemiah 10 verse 29 says, They clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes. So they're, they're basically just promising like, we're going to do what's right in God's eyes. Verse 30, And that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring where or any vittles. Wear is just like merchandise. It's just things to buy. It's, it's, it's you know, um, things, that, things that you buy. Anyways, uh, and if the people of the land bring, any, bring wear or any vittles, vittles would be like food, um, things to eat, on the Sabbath day to sell that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So they're trying to do everything right by God. They're saying, well, if someone else is going to come, if they're going to come here and try to sell on the Sabbath day, we're not going to buy from them. We're not going to buy any food. We're not going to buy any merchandise. And he says, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So they're talking about the, the, even the law that refers to, you know, people owe you money that at, at the end of seven years that that debt goes free. And, you know, the, the people in Israel weren't supposed to be servants forever. You're supposed to set them free as well and you had the year of jubilee and all these other things and they all um a lot of them go hand in hand so um the seventh year was like a sabbath year for the exaction of debt now look at chapter 13 of nehemiah of nehemiah nehemiah 13 verse 15 it says in those days saw i in judah some treading wine presses on the sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine grapes and figs and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? So when they come in, they set up shop, they've got these fish, they've got the wine presses being treading down, they've got all this stuff and all this work going on, and they're profaning the Sabbath day. None of this should be happening on the Sabbath day according to the Bible. And this is true. If you're going to obey the Sabbath, this is the way it ought to be obeyed. No buying, no selling, no working, nothing. No cooking. No starting a fire to keep yourself warm. Nothing. You rest. Verse 18, Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should be that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now, basically, what they did was shut the city down, and they're saying the Sabbath's being profaned. There are people that don't care about the Sabbath. They're coming in, they're buying and selling and setting up shop at the marketplace. We're gonna lock the gates. So these people, these heathens can't come in and try to sell to us. We're just going to shut everything down and you can't um, do that. Now, 
This is similar to the way things were in the United States, um, except on Sundays. And you still see it in some of the smaller towns. And um, it's kind of interesting that, that people have, have kind of changed. They want to change the Sabbath to be Sunday instead of Saturday. And they think they're still like observing the Sabbath that way. Now, I don't believe that. I don't think we need to observe the Sabbath at all. Um, in the New Testament, and we'll, I'm, gonna, I'm almost into that point now. We're going to be getting into the New Testament real quick. But um, there's nothing wrong with taking a day of rest. And especially in the smaller towns, you know, you're only going to work so many days. You might as well take the day off that you're going to church anyways because you need to go to church. But, um, you know, some people tend to think of Sunday. And I know growing up, I used to think this too, that Sunday was the Sabbath day. That it was just like, oh, well, the New Testament Sunday is the, sa the Sabbath and not Saturday. But that's really not the case. Sunday is just a day we meet to worship for other reasons, but it's not, it's not a day of, uh, of rest. You know, when we go out soul winning, that's not rest. You know, when we go out and do other things, you know, whatever. It's a, we eat, we prepare food, we do other things. We're not, it's, we're not dedicating this day as a Sabbath of rest. Um, you might dedicate a day unto the Lord to do all the Lord's service and Lord work, and that's great. Amen. And even if you do take a day of rest, there's nothing wrong with that. And we'll see that in the New Testament. You can do that. But um, we, do not, we are not under this aspect, this law, this commandment to keep the Sabbath day in the New Testament. Now, um, yeah, I'm not going to cover that. I'll just mention real briefly, there was actually, the land was supposed to have a year of Sabbaths unto itself too. Like every seven years, the land was supposed to be able to rest. And there's so much wisdom in this. There's wisdom in yourself just getting rest and not you know, working yourself so much that it's going to lower your, your health, your immunity, and you're going to get sick a lot more frequently if you're just burning a candle at both ends and just constantly working. You need to rest. Your body needs to rest to, to have you at your full potential. Well, it's the same thing with the land. When you're, when you're growing crops, when you're cultivating the land and stuff like that, you can't just keep having the food draw all these nutrients and minerals and everything out of the ground and just sucking everything up out of the land just continually forever because it'll ruin the land. The land needs to have its rest as well. And um, anyways, that, that was also a Sabbath that the Bible refers to. I'm not going to get into that tonight. There's plenty of other material I want to cover. Um, now let's get into the New Testament because... What I believe is that Christ has fulfilled the Sabbath. If you remember, the Bible says that, you know, Jesus Christ said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And this is the whole reason why we don't observe everything that was done in the Old Testament is because some of the laws, some of the commandments, some of the ordinance, some of those things that were established were fulfilled when Jesus Christ came and died and rose again from the dead. He fulfilled many aspects of the law and of those ordinances. Now, not everything has been fulfilled. Not every, you know, the second coming hasn't happened yet. There are still things that haven't completely been done away with, but there are many that have, like the Levitical priesthood. We're under the, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek, not, not, the, not under the order of Aaron or Levi. Um, that's one of the things that has changed. But... Think about this, Christ fulfilling the Sabbath. When Jesus Christ died, we're coming up on Easter real soon, a few weeks away. Um, when Jesus Christ paid for our sins, the way it worked out, you know, he was killed on the preparation day, which was the day before the Sabbath. And that Sabbath was the Passover, right? Jesus was our Passover. Life. So many prophecies being fulfilled with Jesus Christ dying on the night that he died. Now, when Jesus Christ died... It was in the evening. It was at even. And they didn't want to leave the bodies hanging up on the crosses for the Sabbath day. They, needed, they wanted to have them all taken down. Um, and when Jesus died, it was right around, like right at the evening time. And you can get this from Scripture. I'm not going to prove all this tonight. Look it up for yourselves. I've proved it in other, in other sermons. He died right when Passover was starting. Because their days start, it went from even to even, right? Their Sabbath was from even the day before all the way until even the next night. We saw that in Scripture tonight. So the Passover was a Sabbath. That started, we call it the night before, right, at evening. 
and lasted all the way until the next evening. Well, Jesus died in the evening. He died at the very start of Passover. He was our Passover lamb. That was a whole day that they were not supposed to be doing any work. The next day was the, be you know, was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Another Sabbath day, right after the Passover, there was two Sabbaths back to back. And this is always the way it is. But in this particular year that Jesus died, there was also, that was like Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday was the normal Sabbath that they would have every week anyways. So when Jesus was dead for those three days and three nights, those were three Sabbaths of no work that was supposed to be done by anybody. Jesus Christ, while he was paying and doing all the work for our sins, when the Bible says that his soul descended into hell, and he was in hell for those three days and three nights, that, that he was dead after he was crucified. He did all of the work for our salvation. Man was supposed to be doing zero work. And this is the rest that we receive in Christ. This is the rest that we have when we rest completely on Jesus Christ for our salvation, we cease from our own works. We don't do our own works to be saved. We completely rest in Jesus Christ as all the people were resting and doing zero works whatsoever during the entire time that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. I got a few verses here just to, to prove what I'm talking about because we know for a fact that Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights. And when he was risen, it says in Matthew 28, 1, you don't have to turn, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 12. But in Matthew 28, 1, the Bible says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So when Jesus rose, it was towards the first day of the week. So it was at the end of the, the regular Sabbath, which is a Saturday, because the first day of the week is a Sunday, right? That's when he rose from the dead. John 19.30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, this is when he was on the cross and dying, it says, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. That verse alone says, okay, when he rose, it was after the regular Sabbath day, but when he was, when he was crucified, when he was killed, that Sabbath day was in high day. It was, it was more than just the regular Sabbath because it was the day of Passover. Um, that alone can show you that, and then combine that with we know that Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights, and when you start studying out the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Breads, you could see how he was... Um, those three days and three nights, nobody was doing any work because they were all Sabbaths of rest. Now, if you're in Matthew chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse number one. Um, think about this too, because the Jews were constantly upset with Jesus Christ because, remember, he would heal on the Sabbath day. And, and that would make them so mad they wanted to put him to death. Why did they want to put him to death? Because that was the law for breaking the Sabbath. It was a death penalty. And they would look at, oh man, I can't believe Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. We need to put him to death. He's doing this work. Now, they were misunderstanding the commandment anyways. They didn't understand the, the, the spirit of the commandment, why it was given, and what would and what would not be allowed. Now, God was very strict about no work being done. However, the healing that was done and someone being made whole was, Jesus very clearly explains, that is not breaking of the law. Now, let's, look, let's read a little bit here from Matthew chapter 12. Verse number 1 says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. 
But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. So he explains to them, they're condemning the guiltless, meaning his disciples are guiltless. They have nothing to be guilty of. Even though they're walking through the cornfields and they're plucking off the corn to eat, he's saying that he brings up this story of David because the showbread that was, that was in the tabernacle was not allowed to be eaten by anyone except for you know, the Levites, the priests were only allowed to eat that, that bread and those, those offerings and the sacrifices and stuff like that. It was not just for other people. David was of the tribe of Judah. He was not a Levite. He was not a priest. He was not any of those things. Now, he was king, but even, you know, at this time, he wasn't even king yet. But regardless, you know, the king can't even do those things. That food was dedicated and, and only allowed for the Levites to, or the priests to eat. Um, yet, David ate. You know, there was this special circumstance where um, he needed food, and that food was there, and that, that was acceptable to allow him in that situation to have that food, even though normally under normal circumstances, he was not allowed to eat that type of food. And he's saying basically it's the same thing on the Sabbath day. I mean, they're with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're, they're doing his work. They're following him completely. And they're hungry. They need food. They're not at home and able to do like the preparation day and stuff. They're, they're with Jesus doing what he needs to be doing. And if they're hungry, he's saying they can eat. They're not guiltless. They're not guilty of that sin. And that's where he says, if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The sacrifices are part of the law. They were important. I'm not saying they're not important, but that's not what it was all about. That's not what these laws were for. Were just, just for the sake of a sacrifice. There is mercy involved and there's things that are much more important to understand um, that they were completely omitting. And, and, not, and not adhering to. Um, That's where he said, for your meaning, the, omedi the, the weightier matters of um, mercy and judgment. And I can't remember the reference to that scripture, but um, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number nine. The Bible says, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. This infuriated the Pharisees that he healed this man. And he's saying, look, and he's pointing out their hypocrisy. He's saying, which of you, you know, you have an axe and it's a sa an ox and it's a Sabbath day and they fall into a pit or something or, you know, aren't you going to go out and like get them out so they don't die? Like you have this animal so it doesn't die. You're going you're gonna to help them out. Of the, you're going to do that work to bring them out of the pit. And he's not condemning them for doing that. He's just pointing out their hypocrisy. He's saying, you know, you're going to do that. And that's just an animal. How much better is this person, you know, that, that's, that's been plagued with this disease to heal him on the Sabbath day? He's saying you're ridiculous to, to, to bring this law to the point to where you think that you can't even help somebody because it's the Sabbath day. That's not why the Sabbath day was instituted. It's instituted for your benefit. We're going to see here. Turn to Mark chapter 2. Here in Matthew 12, turn to Mark 2. We're going to see what Jesus says here about the Sabbath day and, and, and help maybe give you a little bit more understanding of the Sabbath day. Mark 2, verse 24. Mark 2, 24 reads, And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye not, never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger? He and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. He's saying, you know, the Sabbath was created for you. It was created for man to give you that rest. You weren't created just so that you can't do any work on the Sabbath. Like he's like, don't, don't put the one before the other. The fact that, you know, 
the Sabbath was created for you and doing well on the Sabbath is okay, but it was created so that you can get your rest and that you, you know, obviously you're honoring God, but he's saying the Sabbath wasn't, you know, created for, uh, you weren't created for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was created for you. And then in verse 28, he says, therefore, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ was Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ was not, um, like he was able to, um, because he did end up doing work on the Sabbath day, yet he, what he did was righteous. He was not um, sinning with what he was doing. Turn, if you would, to um, well, turn if you would to Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two. In John chapter seven, I'll read from you some more, some more of what Jesus was speaking about the Sabbath. John seven twenty one. Jesus answered and said unto them. I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? He's saying, look, on the eighth day, you need to, to, set, to circumcise your children in order to keep the law of Moses, right? The eighth day. Now, you can't control when a child is born. So when a child is born on a Friday, eight days later, guess what day that's going to be that you need to circumcise them? It's a Saturday, right? The eighth day. So now you're saying, well, we can't do any work on the Sabbath but we have to circumcise our child. So you're in a conundrum. What do we do? Do we circumcise them or not? If we circumcise them, you know, we're doing work. If we don't circumcise them, we're not keeping the commandment of Moses to circumcise them on the eighth day. And that's what he's, he's pointing out because they would circumcise them. They say, well, that's not work. We're still obeying God's commandment. And that's, that's like an exception, if you will, because it's not really the work that he's referring to about doing. And he's saying, look, when you circumcise someone, you're, you're taking away some of their flesh. He's like, if you could do that and that's okay, I can't make them whole, like, like, like make them complete. And that's why he says in verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. He's saying, you need to judge righteously on this. You need to use a little bit of discernment and, you know, he's saying like common sense basically, but... You need to, to not just a, what's on the surface, but you need to judge righteous judgment. The, the Sabbath was not, you were not made to just obey the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you. Understand the purpose of the Sabbath. Understand the rest and understand that, hey, helping someone in the sense of their, you're healing them or, or, or getting an animal, out, you know, whatever, like those things, it's not like, it's not like you're going to work for the day. It's not like, like I'm going and, and driving into town and doing my work on that day like I normally do. I'm taking a rest. But if something like this comes up, you know, if, if, if your daughter or your son were to be out, were to just like trip and fall down and, and get some serious cut or injury, like he's not saying, well, just let them bleed out and die because it's a Sabbath day. You get to heal that person and it's righteous. There's nothing wrong with that. God's not going to hold you responsible for breaking the Sabbath because you're healing somebody like that. And Jesus is saying it's the same thing. You need to judge righteously. Okay? You need to understand what the law is all about. And they couldn't do that. Colossians 2, this is one of the main reasons why, um, you know, where I believe the Bible is very clear and explicit of why we don't have to follow the Sabbath anymore. Why it's not something that is something that, that we have to um, observe. Now, we all, I already gave you the reason, you know, like Jesus' fulfillment of the Sabbath, in a sense, and we'll get that at the very end when we go to Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews 3 and 4. Is, it also gives us some, a lot more understanding of Jesus Christ fulfilling that aspect of the law. But we can see clearly, explicitly in Colossians chapter 2, look at verse number 13. He says, And you... Being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
Look at verse 16. This is key. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. These are all things that have explicitly been done away with in the New Testament is not having to observe them anymore. He lists off multiple things. He says in meat or in drink. Remember they had the, the ordinances on what they were allowed to eat, what they were allowed to, to drink as far as you know unclean animals and clean animals. I went and spent an entire sermon about this. You know how um, that ban on the food has been lifted. There's other scriptures to prove that. We see that again here in Colossians 2. He says, or in respect to an holy day. Or that's where we get the word holiday from. A holiday is a holy day. And there's many holy days, like the Passover was a holy day. The, these other feasts that they have were holy days. So he's saying, let no man judge you. You're not keeping this holy day. You're not observing the new moon. right? The new moon, they would have feasts for the new moon. Don't let them judge you for that. You don't have to do that anymore. Or of the Sabbath days. And people will try to say, oh no, when he says the Sabbath days here, that's only talking about the special days. Well then why did he list the holy days separate from the Sabbath days? Plural, the Sabbath days. All of them. The Sabbath days are no longer being required to be in observance from, as we can see here, the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2, because he explained, look, those were all a shadow of things to come. There's lots of things you could learn from that, but they were things, they were prophetic symbolism of what's to come in the future, of Jesus Christ, but he already came, he already fulfilled this, that's why we don't need to observe it anymore. Now we already know that he came and, and he's fulfilled this aspect of law. Romans chapter 14, another reason. Another scripture that we don't have that you could show people why we don't observe the Sabbath anymore. Romans 14, we have Colossians chapter 2 saying, don't let anyone judge you <coughs> for whether or not you observe these things. Because those things are just a... Actually, it's more not whether or not you do. He says, let no man judge you in meat or in drink. Like, no one should be judging you for not keeping these things or for not keeping the... The, um, the, the food restrictions or the you know, respect of a holy day because they were just symbols of what was to come. Romans 14, look at verse number 4. It says, look at again, judging. And uh, it's funny that I just had that conversation today with this girl because every time I talk to these people that are so big on the Sabbath day, what do they do? I mean, Almost every single time they're judging, oh, well, we don't do it on Sunday. We, and that's like their whole focus. And they're just so bent on judging everyone else for not observing their Sabbath and not holding worship service or you know, church service on a Saturday and holding on a Sunday. And look at what the Bible says here in Romans 14, verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand." One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. He's saying, look, and this is also, but this in, in this verse is also why we don't judge the people, oh man, why why are you holding church on Saturday and not on Sunday? You want to worship God, you want to serve God on Monday or Friday or Thursday? Who cares? I'm not gonna judge you about it, but don't judge me for holding a church service on a Sunday. Because the Bible says not to do it. He's saying, look, one person esteems one day above another. And that's fine. You want to esteem? You want to esteem and set apart Saturday as a day not to do any work? Fine. Go ahead and do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There is no, no bad thing about doing that. But don't judge me or tell me that I have to do the same thing because we are not any longer under that commandment. 
That is not something that we have to do today. That's why you can esteem one day above another if you'd like, or you can esteem every day alike. Now, why would he say we could esteem every day alike if we had to set apart Saturday and, and keep that holy and sanctified unto the Lord? It wouldn't make any sense. We would have, he would have to mention that somewhere in here that, well, the Sabbath is esteemed. You could esteem all the other days the same and set apart other days, but you still have to keep the Sabbath. It wouldn't make any sense. Turn, if you would, last place we're going to turn, I think, Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews 3 and 4, basically. Um, they're... The end of Hebrews 3 spills into Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews is a great book. There's a lot of outlining of these um, carnal ordinances and, and um, explanation of Old Testament um, ordinances and laws and things that, that, are, that are done away and really given a full explanation of their meaning is found in the book of Hebrews which makes sense because the book of Hebrews was written essentially to the Jews so that they could make sense of the Old Testament versus the New Testament and the changes that are made as a result. So we're going to look at the end of Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And I'm not going to read this entire chapter. You could do that later. I'm running a little bit short on time. Hebrews chapter 3, it's talking about um, God not allowing certain people. He's talking about the children of Israel way back um, after they left Egypt and swearing that they're not going to enter into his rest. If you remember, the promised land was their land of rest. And they're not going to enter into his rest. The reason why it says here is because of their unbelief. They were not going to enter into that rest because of unbelief. But we're going to see here, I keep reading in chapter 4, the Sabbath is a day of rest. And we're going to see here, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And so now we see here again, you know, before he was talking about the promised land, now he's bringing in the seventh day. Now he's bringing in, again, the creation and God resting. And he's relating this with entering into his rest. Right? Let's keep reading. Verse number five. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth, that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man should fall after the same example of unbelief. This ties it all together, and, and this is the whole reason why I mentioned Jesus Christ dying in those three Sabbath days while he was dead because the Sabbath day is a picture of our salvation. It's a picture of resting completely in Jesus Christ. We need to enter into his rest the same way that God rested from his works. We need to rest from our works. That's it. The, the, the Sabbath day was given so we could understand this is a, th there is a total rest for us. It's, it's set apart, it's sanctified unto God, that, that Sabbath day was. And it's a day where we have to completely, and that's why he's so strict about work. You know, it's like doing no work. 
because our salvation is not of works, as any man should boast. It has nothing to do with us. It's a rest. And we could completely rest and trust in Jesus Christ, in what he did, in the, slain, in, in the work that he did um, from the foundation of the world. It says... Um, That is the rest that we're looking to. And, and that's what was sim symbolized in the Sabbath day. It's not our own works. It's resting on Christ. It's resting on God. And that is where our salvation comes from. So the, the, the whole purpose of the Sabbath day was to teach that great truth of ceasing from our own works. We've already seen in Colossians chapter 2 and in Romans that um, we don't need, we're not under the law to observe those things anymore. Every, you know, you want to steam the day, fine. If you don't, fine. There's no difference. And um, Hebrews 3 and 4 really give us that, that tying it all together of Jesus Christ being our rest. When he, when he died, paid for our sins and rose again from the dead, we're completely resting in that from our works. Um, that he's fulfilled that aspect of the Sabbath day. So let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your commandments. God, I pray that you would please give us the discernment that we need to understand what things, the way we need to live in the, in the New Testament, what things have been done away or have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ and what things have not yet. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us to continue to grow in grace and in truth and um, teach us the way that we need to live, teach us the way that um, we need to be following you so that we can adhere as, um, completely to your commandments that you've given us. Lord, um, we thank you for all the wisdom you've given us. And, even, and it is wise to, to take a break sometimes and to take some rest. And we all ought to do that as well from time to time, dear God. And um, Lord, we love you and we thank you for that, for that wonderful gift of salvation you've given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.